Okay, why don't we get started for the uh, fourth and final session of our conference. Um, and uh, for this fourth session, for fourth panel, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, making, making news uh, when journalists have an impact on public policy uh, and how the journalists think about it and how the actors in the uh, institutions uh, think about it and how they interact. And so uh, what we've done is we've set up two pairs here to tell two different stories. First, we have our New York pair, right? Jennifer Gonerman um, from The New Yorker. Uh, again, you have your full, their full bio, so I'm not going to do their bios in detail. Um, but Jennifer Gonerman is a staff writer for The New Yorker. Um, and she's going to be talking in particular about a piece that she wrote called Before the Law, a, a story about Khalif Browder, which uh, uh, gained considerable prominence, a very important piece, um, it, uh, both in its own right and as it affected the criminal justice debate. Um, and then we have Scott Levy, who is a staff attorney at the Bronx Defenders, um, where among many of the things that he does, he directs the Bronx Defenders Fundamental Fairness Project, uh, and he has done work that has um, been impacted by the, by, the, by the article and other journalism, and he'll talk about it from his perspective. Um, now, our panels have been uh, very heavily New York-centric, uh, uh, perhaps because our executive director is from New York. Um, so I'm glad that we have a Chicago pair here. Always uh, the second city. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh yeah, but first city in many respects. I'm, a, I'm from Chicago, so. Um, and uh, so our Chicago pair, uh, we have Ken Armstrong, um, who no longer lives in Chicago, but did his most important work while in Chicago. Um, he na Ken now works for the Marshall Project. He's based in Seattle. Uh, but before that, he worked for the Chicago Tribune, and he'll be talking about a lot of the work that he did while at the Chicago Tribune. He then worked at the Seattle Times before moving to the Marshall Project. Uh, and then we have Chick Hoffman, uh, who is with the Office of Appellate Defender in, in Illinois, um, and has been lead counsel in 33 death penalty cases, um, uh, appeals, um, which is a staggering number. And the story they will be talking about is uh, uh, in in particular, the, death, the story of the death penalty um, in Illinois and articles written about it and the actors and how they responded to those articles. So um, I'm going to start with our, uh, and I'm going to stand back, a little bit back, so um, just to be sort of more part of the crowd, we'll see how that works, sort of Phil Donahue kind of style, see if that, <laughs> how that is. Um, so I'm going to start with the, our, our, our New York pair, uh, and I'm going to start with Jennifer. And um, Jennifer, many, many people in here have read the story that you wrote and followed, and followed the story as it unfolded in the news, but, but some haven't, or some haven't read it for some time. So could you uh, tell us how it is that you came to write the story about Khalif Browder um, and how that story unfolded? Sure. Um. Khalif Browder was uh, a young man who grew up in the Bronx. The story I wrote appeared in the New Yorker magazine um, about a year ago in October 2014. And it tracked uh, his life starting when he was 16 years old. One night he was walking home late from a party and uh, with a friend in a police car pulled up and somebody in the backseat pointed him out, accused him of robbing him at some point earlier, a week or two earlier, of his backpack. Khalif insisted he hadn't done it. The police took him to the precinct. He thought he'd be in custody, you know, an hour or two, get it straightened out, go home. Instead, he spent three years confined in Rikers Island, the penal colony in New York City. And he spent so much time locked up because he insisted he was innocent and he wasn't going to take a plea to something he hadn't done. He wanted his trial, and he didn't understand at the time the trials in the Bronx take forever. And at the end of the uh, at the end of this saga, he um, was ultimately released and never convicted, and the charges were dropped, and the DA's office admitted they didn't really have a case. But before, we, before you go on on the story, how, how, did, how did you come to be uh, connected to this story? Sure. So while this was going on, Khalif was just you know another person on Rikers Island. He got out in the spring of 2013 and filed a civil suit against New York City and got a tiny bit of press. And 
in early 2014, I uh, thought maybe I would write about him. I mean, he'd gotten a little bit of press, but I thought three years on Rikers Island with no conviction, that's insane. And I hadn't, you know, nobody really knew his name or anything like that. And so I was reading the complaint in his civil suit and realized that almost every single thing wrong with the criminal justice system in America had happened to him. So, you know, court, everything from court delays to being in solitary confinement where he spent uh, about two years to the horrific conditions on Rikers Island, brutality, et cetera. And I ended up meeting him and sitting down with him. And at this point, he was 20, about to turn 21, and told him I wanted to write a story about him and asked him if he wanted to be written about. And, uh, and he did. He didn't, and that's why he brought the civil suit. He didn't want this whole trauma, this whole ordeal that he had endured to count for nothing. He wanted it to, to mean something. He wanted people to know about it. And we ended up spending a lot of time together over the course of the next you know, six, nine months. And I wrote the story about him that, that I mentioned. Can you, can you um, describe him a little bit for us? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Khalif was like, in just a, when you met him, he was just like a nice kid. He was like incredibly polite and sweet. And you're thinking to yourself, wait, you spent three years in jail? This, is, this has got to be a total nightmare. You know, he didn't, he didn't walk out of jail seeming like somebody who was very hardened or as if time went by easily. Um, and I think in retrospect, the sort of sweet and polite nature that he had probably worked against him. I could get into more details, but he was back and forth to court over 30 times on this ridiculous case and never once got up in court and started screaming or threatening his lawyer or the judge or anybody, the kind of thing that would get you a lot of attention and might get your case accelerated. Um, he was just a, you know, he was just basically a great kid and incredibly smart. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years in a lot of different contexts, and he was, he really stood out for his ability to tell his story with enormous insight. You can see it coming through in the, the quotes that are in that original New Yorker story. So, yeah. Uh, among the things that he described for you uh, were um, incidents of abuse that occurred while he was at Rikers. Yeah, he tried a lot of stories to tell about abuse by correction officers and also abuse by fellow inmates. And um, <clears throat> from the very first time I met him, he was telling me, Jen, Jen, you have to get this videotape from, and he had the exact date, and I can't remember, I think it was September 23rd, 2012, I can't remember exactly. And I was assaulted by a correction officer in the solitary confinement unit when, I was, when he was supposed to be taking me to the shower. And of course, I'm thinking, how am I ever going to get a videotape of that? But he knew it had happened right in front of the cameras. And it wasn't like the worst time he got assaulted or the worst thing that happened to him by any means. But it just stuck in his mind because it, it had been so brazen. Like this correction officer thought it was OK to assault him in full view of the camera. It was just like another, just another indignity. And he just, he just so much wanted sort of the world to know what, what had gone on or what was still going on. And then ultimately, after the piece came out, maybe Five or six months later, I actually got a copy of that incident, the video of it and other incidents, and we put them up on the New Yorker website um, this past spring. And I think we're going to show, show them to you. Maybe some of you have already seen them, maybe not. Um, but I warn you, they're, they're a bit graphic. There's a lot of cameras on Rikers Island, not enough, but this is camera in, um, in the jail known as the Otis Bantam Correctional Center, which houses Rikers Island's main solitary confinement unit. It's called the Central Punitive Segregation Unit. Uh, Khalif is at the moment inside his cell, and a correction officer is coming to escort him to the shower, and you'll see him first um, cuff Khalif, put the handcuffs on Khalif before he removes him from the cell. And, and, and just to give a little bit more context, was there, were the, was there supposed to be a fight that, and something else happened? How, well, in Khalif's, in Khalif's um, recounting of what's going on here, he told me that there had been sort of tension and w angry words between him and the correction officer on, at earlier incidents. And he told me that um, the correction officer had threatened him and said, you know, we're going to resolve this, we're going to take it to the shower, and we're going to work it out, meaning we're going to kind of have a fist fight in the shower away from the away from the cameras to work it out, which might seem like a preposterous thing for Khalif to say, but in fact... Um, these kinds of incidents where inmates recount correction officers um, offering to work it out in this kind of, uh, you know, unofficial way were so common on Rikers Island that they showed up in a, in a recent report by the U.S. Attorney's Office. So that's sort of the backstory of what's going on here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm 
And there's no audio, just video. So you can see that's uh, Khalif's stuff to take to the shower, his shoes and whatnot. So that's Khalif. Yep, that's Khalif. Hmm. And, and he's obviously cuffed while this is happening. Yeah, exactly. And um, <coughs> cuffed. He's got handcuffed. handcuffs on. Yeah. And he told me that at this point, the when the other folks come up, that he's t that the officer was telling him he tried to run. He tried to run as a kind of justification for why he's face first onto the floor. And then Khalif's trying to say, I didn't try to run, I didn't try to run, but of course, you know, never, nobody heard him. Is that the final explanation for the Yeah, I don't know if we want to pause that for one sec. So one of the most disturbing things about that video is that it happened on day number 862, the Riker, that Khalif Bradder was detained in Rikers Island without a conviction. Um, and there was no penalty for the officer when this happened. I don't think anyone ever even watched the videotape after we got in and put it online. Um, there was still no punishment for the officer. He was just, <coughs> according to the spokesperson for the Department of Correction, he was just being retrained. So I think we might have lost the words for the set setting up this next one. Yeah, do you mind telling us? No, I can tell you. This is a, a video shot um, in the uh, adolescent facility, the adolescent jail on Rikers Island. And um, Khalif had earlier in the day there were a number of gangs that run, run these facilities, and Khalif was actually not in a gang, and one of the gang leaders early in the day had spit in his face. So that's what precedes the, uh, what happens next here. So if you can see, Khalif just punched this kid. That's how the whole thing starts. So I remember saying to Khalif, Khalif, why did you punch that kid? I mean, yeah, you were mad, but surely you knew what was going to happen next. And he said he knew exactly what was going to happen next. He knew it was going to be a full beatdown, but he said that's how, this isn't school, Jen. It's like, not like you can just tell the principal when things are going wrong. You have to just stand up for yourself. If someone disrespects you, you've got to fight back, because otherwise they're going to be stealing your stuff and beating on you every day. And this is happening late at night when the guys are about to be locked into their cells to go to bed. At least that's what's supposed to be happening.
It's, um, yeah, it's their version of pepper spray, CO spray. So um, when the U.S. attorney in Manhattan came out with a report on the adolescent jail last year, they likened it to Lord of the Flies. So it's a pretty apt description. So this is pretty much close to the end here. <clears throat> And the only thing really left to happen here is that the, what the inmates call the turtles are coming. And you'll see what I mean. So you met um, Khalif after he got out of Rikers. What, what, what happened? How did, what happened uh, after he got out? Did he resume his life? What, 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 what? How did his life go in the months after he was released from Rikers? Um, he moved back home to his uh, mother's place in the Bronx, not far from the Bronx Zoo, and he had his own bedroom and he started spending a lot of time in it basically recreating the conditions of solitary on Rikers Island. Um, he was in solitary for close to two years, and I think like a lot of people who spent a lot of time in solitary confinement, didn't feel that comfortable being around other people, um, would isolate himself, sometimes would do a lot of pacing, which is something he used to do in jail. When I, in the early days of when I first met him, even though it had been months since he'd come out, you could kind of tell that he'd spent a lot of time in isolation because he was just, there was just a certain level of discomfort or unease being around other people. Um, and I remember his brother telling me, yeah, I used to ask him, hey, you want to go to the movies? You want to do this? And he just didn't really, you know, he's just not that comfortable in large groups anymore. Um, but despite all that, he, he managed to go to GED class, get his GED, make up for the two years of high school he had missed. He lost out on his junior and senior year of high school. Um, <clears throat> at, around the same time the piece came out, he enrolled in Bronx Community College. He had a lot of ups and downs, but ultimately um, earlier this year was doing quite well in, in college. And then what happened? Um, and then in early June, on a Saturday, I, uh, I, uh, my cell phone rang, and I saw it was, the number was Khalif's lawyer. And I had spent a lot of time with him and talking to him over the prior year, and we'd spent a lot of time trying to help Khalif, help him get um, <clears throat> assistance for mental health issues, et cetera. And when I saw his number on my phone on a Saturday, I was just thinking, you know, this, this is not going to be good. And that's when he, uh, he told me that Khalif had uh, taken his own life. So, um, and then and you wrote about it again. Yeah, so then that was about noon or 1 o'clock on a Saturday, and at 7 o'clock I was at his family's house in the Bronx with the attorney. And we walk in, and there's about, this is like the saddest scene I've ever encountered my, you know, in, in all of you know, many years of reporting, and it's 15 relatives in this living room crammed in the living room of the Bronx, and everybody is obviously in a state of shock, but they're also angry, they're depressed, they're con very confused, like, how did this happen? Um, he had uh, hung himself out the window of the second floor of his own home, and, um, <clears throat> you know, this question of how could this happen has been, I think, haunting New York City ever since, and I went home after that, stayed up till three in the morning and wrote his obituary. And the next day, the New Yorker put it on the, the website, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people read the original story, but that was nothing compared to how many people came to the story after, uh, after his death. So suddenly, there were all these people that were not, you know, maybe not New Yorker readers who were learning about Khalif, 
and they, you know, hearing that he had taken his own life, and then with that knowledge and what he'd been through, coming and watching the videos that you just saw, and just, you know, just feeling sort of completely traumatized um, by, by, by what happened. So all these stories are, of course, uh, still available on the New Yorker website. I, I, I commend them all. Um, so um, I, I, this is obviously an extremely painful story to recount and to experience and to have lived through. I, I want to kind of step you back now, because you, at the beginning when you started talking about this, when you first got interested in it, um, you said that the, the thing that interested you when you first read about this story, of, and first of all, you said you read that there was a little bit of media about it. Was, was a, I mean, this guy had spent three years at Rikers, never, been, never got prosecuted, never, ne the case ne never got conviction or anything. It's, ultimately, the case is dropped. There was a, a, a little bit of media, not much. What's I think he did, a, he did a local TV interview, um, and I think he might have done one other interview. TV interview. You know, there were so many horrible things happening on Rikers Island that doing three years and getting your case dropped was like the least of it. You know, Vinnie Schiraldi here, who um, is at the Kennedy School now, but until recently was in the de Blasio administration, is nodding. I mean, the, the New York, uh, Rik Rikers Island was in the New York Times all the time. You know, people, uh, horrific deaths. You know, so a kid doing three years and the case dropped, you know, as horrible as that is, I hate to say it, the other people weren't paying attention. Okay. So, but, but I was struck by something you said which was that drew you to the case, which was you looked at the case and you looked at the complaint and you saw kind of a series of different criminal justice issues pop out from this one case. What were those? What are some of the things that you saw in, in this one case? Well, you know, as a, as a magazine writer, I'm always looking for sort of narratives, powerful narratives that are going to hopefully pull the reader in and take them to the end and, you know, teach them or show them something uh, about how the system really works. So in this case, it was everything from court delays in the Bronx to you know, um, inadequate you know, public defender to uh, just the horrific conditions on Rikers Island. Um, you know, often I think when the media covers the criminal justice system, they cover one part of it. So here's a piece about solitaire, or here's a piece about the court system, or here's a piece about something terrible that happened in Rikers Island. But that's not really how people go through the system experience the system. They experience it, you know, all the pieces connected or not connected. And one of, I think, one of the biggest problems in the criminal justice system is that, you know, everyone's responsible just for their piece. So, like, the judges are responsible for, you know, what happens in court, and then, you know, the jail's administrators are supposed to take care of what happens in jail, and nobody talks to each other, and the whole thing is, like, everyone's just worried about doing their job, and nobody's looking at the big picture. And I felt like this was a story, or Khalif's experience was a way to try to pull everything together and get, uh, you know, hopefully advance the public conversation about how the system really works and doesn't work. Because in a lot of ways, you know, all the dysfunction of the Bronx court system was exacerbating the problems on Rikers Island and vice versa. So you had this one kid caught in a couple of the most dysfunctional bureaucracies in the city. So I, I, wa I want to uh, ask you more specifically about that. You, we saw, of course, the, the video of the abuse, um, and, and uh, I, I'm sure that just captured some of the abuse that he experienced. You mentioned that he spent two years of the three years in solitary confinement. Um, what, uh, you, and you said that he went to court some 30 times during this three-year period. Why, why, why did he never get a trial? What, 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 was that, what was that cycle? What was that problem? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, almost everybody's case ends with a plea deal these days. You know, few cases actually going to go to trial despite what you see on television and in the movies. And yet he believed he had done nothing wrong, so he was not going to take any kind of plea deal. The prosecutors would offer him deals, you know, two years in prison, whatever. He said, no way, I'm not going to plead to anything. I didn't do it. I just want to go to trial. And the insistence on a trial is what, which is, you know, everybody's right, is what dragged this case on and on and on. Um, and Scott can speak about that more than I can, I think, in detail, but that's ultimately why he ended up doing three years, is merely his right to a trial, his, him demanding his right to a trial, and the fact that our speedy trial laws you know, are very dysfunctional in and of themselves means he didn't, you know, ever really get his day in court. And when it finally came, of course, the witness or the victim had disappeared and there was no case, so they just let him out. And I remember him telling me, you know, I was in court one day and they're like, you can go. And 
he's happy he can go, but he's like shocked and he's, no one apologized or explained or, he was like, that's it? That's how this whole thing is gonna end? He's like, that's my life, you know? And he's just, that's why he talked to me so much and he just couldn't believe like his whole nightmare was gonna end with the judge just being, all right, you could go home, just stay out of trouble and just rob him of three years of his life. And he's like, they pretended, this is like him, his actual quote to me was like, you know, they pretended like it was okay, it was not okay. And that was sort of the impetus for the whole, for the whole story. And, and just one last question before I switch over to Scott. You, you, in, in your article, you describe a number of instances where he goes to court and the prosecution, uh, for one reason or another, is not ready, uh, and they ask for more time. Can you describe what that cycle was? What happened with that? Um. <clears throat> So he would go to court and essentially, you know, the prosecutor would over and over again, people not ready, people not ready, you know, maybe the prosecutor is out sick or on vacation or not around or busy with another trial. And there would just be like sort of endless excuses. And they were permitted to get away with it. And it, it, Khalifa like, couldn't understand what was going on. It made absolutely no sense to him. In fact, it makes absolutely no sense, period. But I think within the culture of the Bronx courthouse, people have gotten so used to these very extensive delays that it's like, ah, that's business as usual. But to an outsider, to Khalif or to a reader of the story, it's just like, what is going on here? And I think that's what I was trying to show in this piece is that, you know, it's, it's just not acceptable to just have a case drag on and on and on for no reason just because you don't have, you know, enough judges or whatever the case may be. That's not, you know, we don't have to accept the situation as it is now. Okay. So, Scott, um, what the, um, Jennifer in her piece has captured in human and dramatic detail all of these issues that you are working on day after day. Can you talk about the importance of, of uh, the Khalif article, the Khalif story, and this kind of journalism sure, for your abs work? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I was thinking before I wanted to sort of start talking about the larger policy issues that I wanted to just acknowledge the fact that this is a story about a person um, and that those of us who do this work day in and day out, that's really sort of what motivates us. That's what gets us to work. That's why we go to work. Um, and that when this story came out, I remember how it, it, the reaction in my office was like, I mean, this is awful. This is terrible. But it felt like so many of our clients, right? And then all of a sudden it took on a life of its own outside of the office and people started talking about it, and we realized that there was something more to this piece as, you know, as opposed to every other piece. But for us, this was sort of like a, we live this, we know this, we scream about it all the time, and finally, other people were starting to take note. Um, but you know, at, at the heart of it was a kid, and, and I think what's so, there's so many things about that video, but I think what, what brings it home is that it's a child being kept in a cage, right? And there are no adults around like paying attention and taking care of this person. Um, and, and I think it makes, it, it boils so many issues down to something that is just visceral. You know, as, as Jennifer said, we often think of these issues as discrete and separate issues, but I think a lot of, you know, everybody experiences them as sort of just a, you know, this is life, this is what's actually happening to people in the system. And so I think there were movements in New York that were, tan, you know, in, in, in a policy sense were tangentially related, but in sort of a public consciousness sense were very deeply related. So, you know, in, for me, in 2011, you have, you know, 685,000 people stopped and frisked on the streets of New York. You have over 50,000 marijuana arrests. You have a broad-based advocacy coalition, Communities United for Police Reform, that are advocating for change on a number of criminal justice issues that really makes criminal, makes criminal justice a topic in the mayoral race, right? and that is at least in part part of the election that leads to the de Blasio administration, the, you know, the appointing of a reformer, uh, corrections commissioner, uh, you know, different people in the city government who are open to making big changes and, and want to talk about big changes. So that there was a moment that had started years before where I think a lot of people were primed for these issues. They, they, they knew that they were out there and that this story seemed to just sort of crystallize all of it in a very you know, important and um, just sort of gut-wrenching way. So I think a lot of these elements were sort of out there. There were movements, you know, there were advocacy coalitions uh, pushing for some of these reforms on some of these pieces, but this really brought uh, people together and gave people sort of a common language to talk about a lot of it. 
Um, and it became sort of the, you know, the catch, or not the catchphrase, but it was sort of the, the thing that everyone could sort of point to and say, we know that this is a problem, so then we can take the next step. Um, and so, you know, it, had it taken, you know, had this story come out five years earlier, I'm not sure that there would have been that political and social context that would have received it in the same way, right? There wouldn't have been broad-based organizing organizers ready to sort of, you know, not to put it crassly, but capitalize on, on the moment and to make sure that his story wasn't just a story, but that it was actually a catalyst for real change. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and the fact that the city was primed for that moment has a lot to do with, you know, political and social organizing that was happening had to do with the, which was done in conjunction or at least alongside the, uh, the Floyd case and what was going on in front of Judge Shindlin and the fact that the city was really talking about stop and frisk and policing issues on, in, in a really sort of public way. Um, and, you know, just all of those things were sort of coalescing around, around these issues. And I think it came at a, the moment that people were willing to talk about it. Um, and, and again, well, I, in a second, I want to get to the, your, the work you're doing. Um, but for, for both of you, I mean, you both have, I, I just want to draw out a point that, that I think has been, you, you've said, uh, already perhaps, but uh, you know, you, this story could have been written a number of different ways about Rikers, uh, and you both have pointed out that this, the, 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 the problems, this is not an extraordinary story in the sense that this was happening to lots of people at Rikers and lots of, lots of, in, lots of people w waiting trial and so forth, um, the, the abuse, the delays, the pressures and so forth. Um, you could have written a story about how many hundreds, thousands of people experience these things, the, the, the statistics about it, the studies, and quoting a lot of people. How would that have been different? Uh, was, how essential was it to have the, this, this crystallize in, in the story of one person? You know, I could have written that story, and you probably, like, you know, the average reader would have probably fallen asleep by the second paragraph. You know, I think my, my goal is always to try to get someone to start the story and to read it all the way to the end, which is extremely difficult in our age. I mean, you know, everyone's looking at screens in here, everyone's tweeting all the time, Facebook, et cetera. To get somebody to read a story, sit and read one of these magazine stories, is like a 20 or 30 minute commitment. And I don't just want you to read it because you already care about prisons. I want to reach people that never thought about prisons and could care less, like Scott's friends who are like, hey, what do you do exactly and why is the situation so messed up in the Bronx? Um, and so the easiest way to do that is to, to, to take the reader through this very complex system with a sort of single narrative. And it's just a way to explain a lot of very wonky ideas that would be very uh, sort of abstract and complex and really make them, them real. And I think there's just like an absence of, of narrative in talking about the criminal justice system that I think needs to, to be invoked to really help people make sense of how this is affecting people's lives. And the other thing that's been missing from the public debate are the voices of people directly impacted. You know, it's easier for me at my desk to call and get a Harvard professor on the phone to tell me what's wrong with the system than it is for me to go find somebody who just got out of jail and track them down and sit with them and get them, see if they'll trust me with their story. But what that person has to say, I, you know, uh, no offense, I think is going to be very powerful. You know what I mean? And I think that the media relies perhaps a little too heavily on kind of quote expert quotes, you know, like people that are studying the system. And I think it's the people that are directly impacted that have the most important and powerful contribution to make to the conversation. And I think that's why reading a piece about somebody who has gone through the system and him giving his firsthand account of what's happened is what gives it that extra power and insight. So Scott, you, you said this, this case has been invoked in a whole series, range of uh, meetings um, and discussions about criminal justice issues. Can you just sort of tick through how this has played out and, what, and the, some of the, the policy work that you're doing? Sure. I mean, um, I mean just, just to start on, I, and I think when you're talking about how did this possibly happen in the Bronx courts, um, I, I will uh, go into the weeds for just a second, but New York's speedy trial law is not really a speedy trial law at all. It's really what's called a ready rule. It sets a time frame in which the people need to be state ready for trial, but it's not actually a time frame for trial to occur. Um, and so what happens is, uh, and time only accrues when the people are stating not ready. So the people will, will state not ready and say we'll be ready in a week. But because of court congestion, the case gets adjourned for three months, but only that week gets charged against the clock. So the time accrues at a snail's pace 
Um, and if both sides are ready and there are just no courtrooms available, no time accrues. So, right, for the, the charge that Khalif was charged with, um, the speedy trial clock was six months, right? But after three years, that six months still had not run. Um, and so our clients are coming back to court over and over and over again with no realistic hope of ever having their day in court. Um, and what I work on a lot is people in the criminal courts, people charged with misdemeanors. And you know, I have numbers of clients who came back to court for over two and a half years because they wanted a trial on a marijuana case, and they had 22 trial dates. Right? They weren't sitting on Rikers, uh, but they had jobs and lost jobs and got jobs and then lost them again because of these open cases. And so, if what if you know if you are in this court system that promises you the right to a trial, and you want to actually exercise that right, you have to be willing to endure years of delay. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I work on is uh, speedy trial reform. Uh, you know, in, in terms of Khalif's name getting um, invoked, there is now a bill, uh, I think, before the state legislature, which is an amendment to criminal procedure law 3030, which is the, the speedy trial law. And uh, a, the, the legislature, I think, has called it Khalif's law. Um, and that, that was uh, made public, I think, earlier uh, in the summer. Um, but so speedy trial reform, which is deathly boring, but vital, um, you know, is, is one of the ways that I think this piece and, and other, you know, uh, pieces of the media have really sort of allowed us, uh, people who are working on this, to get in the room with policymakers and to talk about it in a serious way. Um, bail reform, uh, bail reform has become a, a big topic uh, in the city and in the state. Uh, both with the judiciary and the city government. Um, and the fact that, you know, he was kept in at least initially on $3,000 bail for, a, you know, and that that's at least initially what kept him in for the, the duration of this case um, is also sort of an issue that is bubbling through, um, you know, again, the city and the judiciary. The judiciary. Uh, Rikers, of course, is a huge, you know, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, involvement in Rikers issues and the reform efforts being undertaken by the city. Uh, this is a huge, this was a huge sort of catalyst for some of that. That work was going on when, these, when this piece came out, but I think, again, it helped really crystallize some issues. Um, and, you know, solitary confinement, it, it, it's... Raised the age. Raised, yes, raised the age, uh, right, because New York's one of the only places where a 16-year-old is automatically considered an adult in the criminal system, whether it's a turnstile jump, a marijuana arrest, or uh, you know, a, a felony robbery. So it, it touches on each and every one of these things. And one of the things I sort of wanted to talk about here is that in order for the, uh, the impact to be felt, you actually have, you have to have broad-based you know, advocates, broad-based sort of organizing and advocates who are already working on these issues um, so that when policymakers are open to change, there are people who have workable answers that, that can be sort of proposed within that short window of time that you have when people are really paying attention. Um, I, I, okay, and, and I want to now, Scott, ask you how, how, how do you engage with the media? Because we've now talked about how this piece and played such an important role. Um, does that affect the way you do your work? Are you looking for stories to tell the to, to tell the media? Do you promote them? How do you balance that with your responsibilities as a lawyer towards your clients? Um, I, uh, how 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 do you do you use try to use the media for your ends? Absolutely, and I sort of occupy a, a unique space in in our office. I'm one of the few people who are actively thinking about media strategies and thinking about the press. Um, and my, the, the learning curve was very steep initially um, because I didn't understand how to interact with media. I didn't understand how to act, interact with, with reporters. And my education really took place in, in 2012, 2013 when the New York Times was doing uh, an in-depth series on delay in the Bronx court system. Um, it was a series that Bill Glaverson wrote. Uh, it was the last article he, he wrote before he left the Times. Um, and I was essentially on Bill's speed dial for eight months leading up to that, leading up to that story coming out. Um, and I was to a total novice when that process began. And by the end, I realized that, uh, that there is sort of a, 
You have to learn how to manage journalists when you're interacting from an advocacy point of view, that it's not just giving good quotes and thinking of, you know, and trying to present good stories, but you have to sort of create interesting packages and you have to sort of think two steps ahead and when, you're, when you're talking to a journalist. So now, you know, um, you know I, I think, uh, and one of the things I also learned is that I think in that New York Times piece in 2013, we were very effective at getting a story out about dysfunction in the Bronx courts. Um, and then the result of that story and that, that reporting was that the chief administrative judge got fired and we got a judge kind of brought in from Brooklyn who disposed of hundreds of cases in six months by basically, but you know, and it's a judge that appears in, in Khalif's case. Um, and, and then after six months, she became a judge on, uh, she got her own TV show called Hot Bench. And, and life in the Bronx went back to normal. Um, and the structural problems remained. And so I think we were success successful in that moment of bringing these issues to light, but not necessarily of having the answer for when we had that moment of attention. And I think the way that policymakers react to these stories, right, they want a counter story quickly, and they want, they want a story that says we're taking action, these are our action steps, move on. Um, and I think it's the sustaining, the thinking of as an advocate how to sustain those reform efforts and work with the media to do that is a very tough, tough thing to do. Um, and of course, you know, as a public defender, my first obligation is to my client. And so I, I can't just go share any story that I want with the press. You know, I, I have hundreds of stories that I would love to see you know, in the New Yorker, uh, but they're my clients and I can't, you know, just run, run to a reporter every time. Okay, um, I, I'm gonna now move over to our Chicago pair. Um, and uh, this is a very different um, story, the story about the death penalty. And Ken, um, you did a number of pieces for the Tribune about the death pen penalty in Illinois. Can you set it up for us and describe how it is that you got into that space and the kinds of stories that you wrote. Sure, in the, um, in the late 1990s, a uh, long time ago, yes. um, Illinois had two numbers that continued to climb in parallel. Um, one was the number of death row inmates who had been executed since capital punishment's reinstatement. The other was the number of death row inmates who had been exonerated. These two numbers were climbing at the same time. You'd have nine executed, nine exonerated, 10 executed, 10 exonerated. And each time this happened, there would be more media attention as to what is going on here, because those two numbers should not be the same. That's indicative of a serious problem. And what we decided to do was to take a systematic look at what was happening in the state and try to figure out what were some of the fault lines underneath this. And the approach we decided to take was to look at every case since reinstatement and break it down and chart it out. At that time, there had been 285 cases since reinstatement in 1977. So we went and we pulled the files for all of them. And I had this hand-drawn spreadsheet. I mean, this wasn't even an Excel spreadsheet, it was hand-drawn, where we had all of these boxes and as we pulled each file and as we learned more about each individual case, we would fill them in and we would see if there were any patterns that emerged from it. And there were. And the most troubling ones we found were included these. We, we found 33 cases where the attorney who represented someone who wound up being sentenced to death uh, was later disbarred or suspended. We found 46 cases where a person had been convicted or condemned in part with the, the help of testimony from a jailhouse informant. Jailhouse informants are a notor notoriously unreliable you know, form of testimony. We found 35 instances where a condemned um, inmate was African American and the jury that de delivered either the guilty verdict or the sentence was all white. And in some of those instances, the prosecutors would use 20 peremptory strikes to remove African Americans from the jury pool in order to get an all white panel. Um, we found 20 instances where someone was convicted or condemned um, with the help of the visual comparison of hairs or fibers. Not talking about DNA evidence, talking about 
looking under a microscope to see whether two hair samples or two fiber samples look alike. Also a very problematic form of evidence. So in November of 1999, we published a five-part series looking at these various elements and others. And it was the kind of story that, as Jennifer said, you might expect to not find a very large audience because it was dense. Right, it it's was a very rich so with numbers. It, it's a very different approach from what Jennifer described in the Khalif Browder story. So, how, what was it? Did people read the stories to the end? Um, they did, and I, I well, who's to say? I know one person who did, and that was the governor of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fortuitous for us because two months after we published the series, he held a press conference and he declared a moratorium on executions. And he recited all those numbers that I, I just uh, described. And he said that his faith in the system was so shaken that he was not gonna authorize any more executions until he was convinced that these problems had been addressed. Um, he also talked about one particular case where a, a number of Northwestern journalism students had helped free somebody from death row, somebody who had come within two days of execution. So his was a blend. At the same time, in that five-part series, we're writing about individual cases. Just as in Jennifer's story, there was a lot of context about speedy trial and Rikers, the Bronx criminal courts. Ours was a system story, but it had a lot of narrative elements as well so that people could take these numbers and attach them to individual people and individual cases. Uh, so Chick, your, um, when these stories come out, um, I, I don't know if you knew that they were in the works, uh, uh, if you have been in touch with Ken or the other journalists, or if you read about them for the first time when they came out, but you're um, fighting a hard battle in death penalty cases and fighting the death penalty how, what's the impact of these stories to your work? Well, the impact to our work was, I think, before the ink was even dry on the series, it was in our briefs. Um, it, it was in all our capital briefs, um, all their findings. If we had a, a jailhouse informant in a case, we cited the series. If we had an all-white jury, we cited the series. I think the power in Ken's story was uh, it transformed the anecdotal into the systematic. You know, if, if we said a jailhouse lawyer is unreliable, you know, it's anecdotal, maybe this one guy's unreliable, but when you put it all together, um, it, it, it was so powerful, it was, it, it was such a systematic demonstration of all, every flaw, almost every flaw, that we had in our capital uh, punishment system. And it, it occurred to me how fitting it is that Ken is now with the Marshall Project uh, and speaking on the topic of the death penalty because I remember it was Justice Marshall who in his concurrence in Furman versus Georgia wrote that if the American people ever uh, were fully informed about what the capital punishment process would like, they'd promptly reject it. And I think that's really what Ken and other investigative journalists did. They validated Justice Marshall's thesis. They informed the American people, the people in Illinois, the governor of Illinois, what the, the realities of our death penalty process. And in our state, uh, the public opinion on the death penalty and public policy on the death penalty underwent a sea change and ultimately led to abolition. We, we also used the Tribune story and the case that Ken talked about, uh, Anthony Porter, who came within two days of being executed in all of our blanket clemency petitions. Governor Ryan declared a moratorium on executions in 2000, and in 2002, uh, we decided to move for blanket clemency, which was filing a clemency petition for all 167 men and women on Illinois' death row. And we didn't know if this would work or not, we didn't know, but, but we thought this would once again focus attention on all the flaws, and of course, these weren't the usual capital clemency petitions. We, weren't, we didn't have a client who had rehabilitated on death row. Some of them did. But this was just, in some cases, we had really nothing to say other than the death penalty is too flawed to fix. Governor, don't, don't execute anybody. So um, when this five-part series came out, did, did you think, well, you know, why didn't we do this? 
Like why 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 was it that why did the why did the Tribune I mean this these were this was information that was available. Why is it that the Tribune pulls this together? Why is it in your office? How is there some dynamic there that well, I don't know. I mean, we're fighting a case at a time, and we have a client, like Scott said, but, and I don't know that we had the resources to do this. Um, this is, you know. Well, this is a different time of investigative journalism. Today, we talk about how there isn't resources for investigative journalism, and, and this is a time when investi it, that's where the well, resources were. You know, we, from reinstatement to abolition in Illinois, was this long arc of about 35 years. And during that whole process, there were various pieces of investigative journalism. There were a lot of actors involved in the reform and abolition process, uh, religious leaders, civic organizations, abolitionist activists. The common thread really was that we all relied on investigative journalism. And there were a number of pieces over the years. Really, the, the story of abolition in Illinois, uh, some of it is, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Investigative journalism in Illinois exposed that the state of Illinois bought its lethal injection machine from a Holocaust revisionist that, uh, who had a contract to supervise our executions. So when that came out, uh, we used that fact uh, to actually, we called all the Jewish legislators in, in the Illinois General Assembly and, and uh, they scrapped the lethal injection machine and fired the guy. It was investigative journalism that reported that we literally, in Chicago, had a torture chamber in the interrogation rooms in a police station on the south side of Chicago. And I don't mean police brutality, I mean electric shock to the genitals, to the ears, to the lips, uh, handcuffing to hot radiators, guns in the mouth, uh, suffocation with uh, typewriter bags, uh, and John Conroy, an investigative journalist with the uh, Chicago Reader, the alternative uh, weekly magazine there, over a 17-year period from 1990 to 2007 wrote 23 very lengthy expose articles about this. And this is just you know, another example. What John Conroy's articles did was laid the foundation for some very real reform. Uh, Cook County Judiciary appointed a special prosecutor to look into uh, these allegations of torture, which ultimately exposed that over 100 African American men were tortured there, 14 of whom ended up on death row, some of whom are still incarcerated. Um, it also led to the state of Illinois establishing the Torture Inquiry and Relief Commission because our courts were uh, unable to deal with uh, the torture issue uh, in our usual state collateral proceedings. And so the Torture Commission, which was established five or six, seven years ago, is now referring some of these cases to court. And finally, Conroy's series led to, just this year, the city of Chicago passing a reparations ordinance. These guys who were tortured and exonerated, or even not exonerated, are, are now applying for reparations from the city of Chicago. Uh, if I can make a sports analogy, you know, the long fight for reform and abolition of the death penalty in Illinois was like a 15-round heavyweight fight, and a lot of these investigative pieces were body blows, and then the Anthony Porter case that Professor Protest exposed, and Ken and the other Tribune writers' uh, series on the death penalty were like the one-two knockout punches, because they had such a profound effect on our governor that, uh, as Ken mentioned, he stopped executions, and he ultimately uh, th threw everybody off death row. So um, Jennifer and um, Scott described how the Khalif story was a, was a kind of a, I mean, I, I'm going to simplify a little bit the way I say this, but was kind of a story uh, 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 that was created in part by the moment, or it seized the moment, and, it, and there was... There, was, there were issues percolating, and it resonated because these issues were percolating. I, I, I hear on the, the story that you're describing, both in terms of the death penalty and the, the torture exposés, that there is some of that, but there's also some of creating the moment, of, of, of exposing things that were unknown. Is that, is that fair, Ken, first, and then Chick? Sure. If you look at the late 1990s, there was a um, growing concern about wrongful convictions, largely because of the emergence of DNA evidence. 
And I think that that had laid a lot of the groundwork where people now realize that, yes, innocent people are sometimes convicted, they are sometimes condemned, sometimes people confess to crimes they didn't actually commit. You know, the, the, the DNA revolution really made it possible to do a, a lot of the work that we were able to do. And, and it really pointed to a lot of the problems because you could look at cases where somebody was definitively innocent and then see what kind of evidence had been used by the prosecution to, to gain a conviction. So you could learn a lot from those individual cases. There was definitely momentum, I think, at that time for reform, but not abolition. Right. You know, and what was striking to me is that after Governor Ryan declared the moratorium, there was a lot of polling done, and a very strong majority of the public supported the moratorium. And it wasn't just in Illinois. There was also polling done nationally where there were similar percentages. People realized that the system wasn't working as it should, and they wanted to put the brakes on capital punishment until they could be sure that we weren't condemning innocent people. Uh, so, Chick, as somebody, as an advocate fighting the death penalty, how, how you, you know, you're, as you said, you did individual cases, you, were, you, you did 33 capital appeals, uh, that's where the main part of your work is. How, do you, how did you think about, and you and the others you worked with, think about the media piece? How did you think about, well, how, how, when do I deploy the media? When do I send a story? Because you, know, you, can't, be, you can't send every story there. What, what was the strategic thinking in terms of that element? Well, you know, the media can be your friend when you do litigation, and the media can be your enemy when you do litigation. You have to trust who you're working with. And I, th I think all the lawyers in my agency were really cooperative with, with Ken and, and, and his colleagues. Um, you know, I, I wore two hats, too. I, not only was I doing death penalty defense work, I was also an abolitionist activist. So in that role, um, I kind of uh, had contact with media. Uh, but you can also go a little too far. The, you know, Ken's and the other uh, Tribune writers exposed all the serious flaws in the Illinois death penalty. And based a lot on Ken and the other uh, reporters' writings, that's why we thought, let's move for blanket clemency. When we started, when we, when we filed all the clemency petitions, the prosecutors asked for public hearings. And we had 167 capital clemency public hearings in a period of three weeks. And wow. we were killed bad choice of words. We, we got extremely bad press. It was horrific because for three weeks the family members of murder victims would come in and tell their heart-wrenching stories and it was in the press every day and we thought did we make a big mistake in this? Was this a strategic blunder? Uh, the head of the prisoner review board who were hearing this uh, said it was like going to eight funerals a day. Uh, and even though we were relying on the Tribune stories as the basis for saying, don't kill any of these people who were sent to death row under this completely flawed capital punishment system, the Tribune came out with an editorial saying, don't grant blank and cl blanket clemency. That would be a terrible mistake. So, uh, you know, you have to kind of pick your spots. And uh, we survived that. Uh, but I think the most important thing in deciding whether to work with media is whether you trust uh, the reporters that you're working with. Scott, have you had similar experiences where the media, you, you, the, the, the media has, uh, has uh, hindered, your, hindered your work or made it more difficult? I mean, sure. In, in, in individual cases, you know, that are, you know, where you're pre-trial, the, the, the media calculation there is very, very different from the work that I'm generally engaged in, which is sort of more systemic work. Um, and certainly press for most of our clients in individual cases is a bad thing, right? It's not something that our clients want. Uh, it's not something that's going to be helpful to them. Um, and also, you know, in the, in the series in the New York Times, there was a, it was a four-part series. And in, in part three of that series, they covered a case in our office that was pretrial. Uh, it was a serious felony. And it was a case where the prosecution's case was very weak and that our office was very sort of confident in our, uh, in the fact that it would, the, the case would ultimately be resolved uh, in a fa favorably for our client. And so the, there was, 
there was access given, and that piece, while I think uh, advancing the ball for you know challenging court delay in the Bronx, also ended with a sort of line that said, eh, but he was probably guilty, hmm. right? So for our client, it was a disaster, right? Because he had been acquitted, but the New York Times had basically said, but he did it, right? And so that that was a really tough that was a really tough moment for us and. We had been cooperating with the New York Times for eight months on this series, and this, the piece that I was working with him on had yet to come out, right? So that third piece came out, and there was a lot of uh, angst in, in the office about that one. What I will say is you, you asked, um, you know, why wasn't your office doing this work? Why did it fall to the Tribune to do this? One of the things that I learned during that process with the New York Times was I, I had sort of been tasked with convincing the New York Times that they needed to look beyond felony cases, that they needed to look to misdemeanor cases, and that there was a story there that mattered, that court delay, while wreaking havoc when people are incarcerated and in felony cases, was also wreaking havoc on people's lives in misdemeanor cases, right? It was sort of destroying large, you know, destroying people's lives in little bits, but by the tens of thousands. Um, and that was a much, that's a harder story to convey um, because there isn't a central figure. There isn't sort of a clear example of a, you know, a crystal injustice. And so it was my job to sort of sell that story to them. And the way that we did it, and it became, the reason my title is so vague, I'm, I'm the director of the Fundamental Fairness Project. If you ask me what that means, I can't really tell you, except that it encompasses this, which is that I, for that entire eight months, followed 50 marijuana cases and we de and, and tracked with excruciating detail everything that happened in court. And we produced a report and I was feeding monthly statistics to Bill Glaberson about marijuana arrests and how they were being processed through the Bronx courts. So that while I couldn't control the end story, I had a constant stream of information going to that reporter and what I hoped was going to be overwhelming <laughs> so that I could feel some sort of confidence in what the outcome of that story would be. And ultimately, we were very happy with the sort of results of that story. Um, and I certainly would never claim that I am responsible for that, but I think that just flooding him with information and, and doing the reporting internally ahead of time uh, really helped us, gave us the ability to shape that story. Um, you know, and one of the things too, thinking about when is it useful? When is media useful? When is it not? Uh, one of the cases where uh, we had a, a client who waited two and a half years for a marijuana case, he finally got sent out for a hearing. The cop took the stand, and the third question was, do you have any independent recollection of this arrest? And he said no. And we argued for about an hour, and we got the case dismissed. But that was, my client had lost two jobs in, in, in the process, had come to court 26 times, and he won. But it was one of these, it was sort of like with Khalif's story. You win, but no one says, I'm sorry. No one apologizes for what's just happened. They're like, OK, it's over, next. And what actually made that, I think, a success for our client was we actually had a camera crew from Al Jazeera America waiting for him in the hallway. So he had a very dissatisfying experience in the courtroom, but he walked out into the hallway, and he got to speak to reporters who were interested in, about, interested in the impact that this ridiculous process had had on his life. And for that client, you know, thinking just as, you know, a lawyer who represents clients and how you make give meaning to the processes that your clients are going through, it can't. It doesn't work for every client, for sure. You can't bring a camera crew to every case. But in this case, with a client who is just so dedicated to his cause, that the ability to have his story told by someone was the victory in the case. Um, and so, you know, for the, for the lawyers in the room, right, media does a lot of different things, but in, when done right, I think it can be a victory for your client f when the system really doesn't give them much to hold on to. Um, so I, I want to, um, and I'm going to open it up in a minute, and I, I will get you first. Um, I want to switch to Ken and Jennifer, and I want to ask you two questions. First, y you must get lots of Scots and chicks calling you up with stories and pitching stories and trying to get trying to uh, get you to write write about their the injustices that they're working on and how do you so how do you manage that um, and the second question I want to ask you is is there 
is there in the from the, the Illinois story of the late 90s, early 2000s to the Khalif story of the last couple of years, is there a shift in the way investigative journalism is working or not working or operating? Or, or is, it, is, there a, is it a continual story? Do you see differences? Um, Jennifer, when you hear Ken's story, Ken, could you do the same thing you did today? Um, so if you could both touch on both of those questions. Sure, I'll take the second one. Anyway, um, you know, the, the, the Tribune does not have as robust a staff now as it did 15 years ago, but it is still doing quality investigative work. And what I find now is that I often do a lot of my work through other means. Like right now, I'm working on a story with two partners. It's the Marshall Project, it's This American Life, and it's ProPublica. Uh, ProPublica is an investigative reporting outfit in New York. This American Life is the public radio show. None of those three entities receive funding through the traditional mechanisms, right? We're not getting advertising dollars. We're not, you know, we don't have subscribers. We all have our hands out asking the public to help fund us. And to a certain extent, that works. Um, so I think that a lot of that investigative reporting is still being done. It's just being done through different models. Look at John Oliver on HBO. He's done tremendous work that show has on criminal justice issues. So I still think that that work can be done. It's just not necessarily going to be done by the same people that we were accustomed to seeing doing it uh, 15 years ago. Where I have my greatest concern is in resources. Um, and I'll give you a very quick example. When I worked at the Seattle Times um, in 2006, we did a very long series on court records that had been improperly sealed. And we, we found more than 400 just in King County Superior Court where an entire file had been sealed, not just the complaint, not just a motion for summary judgment, not just a settlement order, the entire file. And once we found those, which was a very arduous undertaking, we then went to court and filed 40 lawsuits to get 40 unsealed. It cost us $200,000 in legal fees wow. to pursue those 40 cases. We made our point. We won 38 of the 40. If we had appealed the other two, we would have won, but we already had the records through other means, you know, through filing public records requests with particular agencies. And they stopped sealing uh, lawsuits. So it really had a terrific ripple effect. There is no way the Seattle Times could do that series again now, you know, after the economy imploded in 2008. And that's where I have my greatest concern, is not necessarily in staffing issues, but when it takes time to fight for public records, and that's going to be an expensive battle, you will sometimes find media entities that decide to go in this direction instead of that one, because they can't afford to fight over here. Jennifer. They really spent $200,000 on legal fees? And this was the Seattle Times. That's <laughs> that is yeah. unbelievable. That's incredible. Um, to say that wouldn't happen today is like just a gross understatement. I mean, um, Ken might be a little bit more optimistic than I am. I feel like, you know, with, with newspapers on life support, that a lot of local reporting, local expertise, local knowledge is under serious threat. And, and when you talk about where do you get your stories from or being bombarded with tips from different people, you know, report, that, that's how it works. People are constantly trying to get the attention of reporters to get their story out one way or another. And when you have fewer people on the ground on a local level, this is certainly true in New York City, you know, when metro sections are shrinking or newspapers or the tabloids are on life support, there's just fewer people out there to, to, to get those calls, um, to put those stories out. So, <clears throat> you know, it's great that some of these nonprofit models seem to be thriving, but I don't, that's... That's one thing, but I think that, you know, sort of the death of newspapers, um, you know, we haven't even yet begun to fully understand what that means for, you know, how do you know about the stories that you never hear about? Do you know what I mean? It's just a very hard thing to, to wrap your mind about. Okay, I'm going to open it up for quite, we have about 10 minutes left, um, and you've been waiting patiently. I, hope, I assume you still have your question. <laughs> Please. Hello, my name is China Book Terrell, and I'm at the Kennedy School. Um, just a couple of quick questions. One, for those who would, um, you know, be skeptical and say, oh, well, maybe Khalif's story is just one story, um, what are the statistics that help us understand, um, like, the broader problem? Um, and then my other question is, um, 
inevitably as, as a consumer of news, sometimes I, I just have this sense that there's that um, what's newsworthy is as segregated probably as like Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, right? Like I have this sense that there's still this deep segregation between what's news for black folks and what's news for white folks, what's news for brown folks. So can you just speak a little bit to that? Like, uh, how are you experiencing that? If it actually is true, is it true um, on the journalist side? And I'm just thinking back to like the 60s when like Martin Luther King, he was like one of the few, if not the only voice that could pierce mainstream media. Um, and so I'm just, I'm feeling like, well, what is this like in 2015? You know, it's hard. I think you definitely have your finger right on a huge, huge problem, one that doesn't get nearly enough attention, which is this question about diversity in the media. Who's making the decisions? What's newsworthy? I mean, D-Ray did a terrific job this morning just you know, talking about that. And just he personally has put so many issues on the media's agenda that weren't going to happen otherwise. And him, and obviously, I mean, him and many of his colleagues in the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, and I think that, in some ways, is their greatest contribution to the country is being, you know, no longer do they have to convince the editor in chief of, so, who, you know, a, a white man at a large institution that their issues are important. They can just take it right to the people and suddenly, you know, like his description of what I guess was UVA this morning and the way they, they um, got their story out I thought was fascinating and in part because it sounded like he was starting to play reporter. You know, he was like making phone calls to make sure that he was putting the accurate facts out, but, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I think in a lot of ways Twitter has uh, you know, refocus the media in very helpful ways, um, or at least drawn their attention to issues, because a lot of the issues that he's talking about, that I've been writing about, have been around for, for a very long time. It's not like this is, you know, conditions on Rikers Island have been horrible for, for decades, you know, it's not like this is new news. But this question of what's newsworthy or who do we get to focus our attention on is, is sort of a paramount importance. Um, and you asked before about Khalif and statistics and how do we know it's not just him, and um, you know, I don't have all the statistics, I don't have the piece right in front of me at the moment, but I mean, he is, you know, in some ways he was an outlier in the fact that he spent three years in, in jail without a conviction. But in, otherwise he, in other ways, his experience was completely representative in terms of what does it feel like to be in solitary confinement, what does it feel like to be a teenager um, being locked up on Rikers Island. I mean, those, were, those are things that are going on all the time, and his ability to talk about them in a very honest uh, and insightful way you know, almost transcend statistics in a way, and I think gave his voice sort of extra power. Larry. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to see. Scott, I, I thought it was really interesting hearing earlier about your own process of kind of gaining expertise <clears throat> and sophistication as a lawyer in how to think about advocacy with the, the media. Um, and you, you described it as uh, uh, needing to to manage journalists and to provide packages that will be useful. Um, and on one hand, that sounds to me like something that from a journalist perspective is great because some of the groundwork gets done um, and there's sort of useful resources. Um, and I could also imagine uh, people sort of resisting the notion that the, uh, that the approach to a story is sort of getting framed by advocates. Um, and clearly sort of both of those things are, are happening. And I just would be curious to, to hear from, from um, all of the folks on the panel about sort of what is the ideal, you know, particularly in the criminal justice context, what is that relationship between advocate and journalist when it's at its best? Like how should the, 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 um, the people on each side of that relationship think about what, what that should be like? I mean, you know, I can go first. And I actually just wanted to return to the, the question before, which is I, in the Bronx, um, when you're dealing with these issues, one of those responses that you get sort of from everybody at some point is, well, it's the Bronx, what do you expect? And what they're, I mean, and you can't detach that comment from race, right? Like that is very much about race and, and what the Bronx represents to people. Um, and it's something that I struggle with every day. So it, that your question really rang true. I don't have a great answer for it. But um, getting people to pay attention to the Bronx is really difficult. And, it's, uh, um, and we have some wonderful examples of people doing that. But you know, it's not easy. Um, and it's not done nearly enough. Um, the, the, the give and take for me, and again, I've now sort of been having press or dealing with press for maybe four years, you know, it really depends on what the journalist is after, why they called you in the first place. I generally actually 
in my experience, I am never actually calling affirmatively and pitching. I'm generally getting called because, and it's something that I mentioned to somebody earlier today, one of the things, you know, for people who are doing long form uh, criminal justice pieces, you know, and thinking about sort of long term reform um, campaigns, is that by, you know, we want a diversity of voices in these pieces, but I, journalists also should know that by putting somebody's name in one of those pieces, you're giving that person the power to get a meeting that they may not have been able to get before, right? So the fact that my name appeared in the New York Times piece got us in the door, you know, got us meetings with city council people that we would not have gotten before, right? So that it's all, these pieces are empowering in that way too, and that's a really important piece. But, you know, some people, you know, if it's Bronx News 12, they want to show up at the office and they want me to say two sentences that will go into their 30 second piece and we have to decide whether what they want me to say is something I'm willing to say, right? And there's sort of a weird little negotiation there. Um, you know, with, with Bill Glavers, and that was a really long term project and with a very sophisticated and very smart journalist, right? And so I wasn't, I, it's not, I would never mean to suggest that I would got anything over on him. I certainly didn't. And the sort of the give and take in that relationship was explicit, right? We, and when we were off the record and on the record, the dynamics changed in that relationship very quickly. And the first time I was on the record with him, I realized that I was not prepared to be on the record with him, right? To answer the kind of pointed questions that he was starting to ask me. So that was like, that was my big education. First time we went on the record, I was like, whoa, like I gotta be better prepared for that moment. Um, and so, you know, Yesterday and, and earlier today, we were also talking about sort of new media and, and we're not really sure what media, um, what, what's going to survive this sort of moment. But in the last six months, I've done pieces with um, Vice TV. Their, Vice is actually taking over a cable channel. It's not up yet, but, and the Al Jazeera America piece. These were, these were news outlets that were brand new and looking for content. And they would literally call us and say, we'll give you well, give, give us content, give us a story. We, we need to fill space in our new media thing. And of course, you know, there's journalism going on there, but they were sort of calling saying, what do you got? And then we would sort of work on that story together. And then I would do an interview and try to find a client that sort of fit the bill. Um, so it really depends on who's doing the reporting. Um, and again, I've, it's, been, it's been a, you know, I haven't always gotten it right, it's tough. I, I can say, for me, when we ran that series in the Chicago Tribune, we didn't quote a single advocacy group, we didn't quote a single expert, we weren't relying on anything that we got from a single advocacy group or a single expert. It was all based on work that we had done independently, and we went out of our way to avoid adding those other voices, because I think a lot of times people in the public automatically dismiss them. So we wanted to make sure that people understood this was coming from our work. And when we published it, we were pretty bold in how we portrayed it. The, the series title was The Failure of the Death Penalty in Illinois. There was no question mark at the end of it. <laughs> our lead was as blunt as it can be about how justice had been forsaken in Illinois because of all of these problems. I don't get pitched a lot for stories by attorneys. I'm much more likely to call them you know, because I'll see something that catches my eye. But even then, I'm not fishing for quotes from advocates or attorneys very often. I'm looking for information. I'm looking for records that they can point me to. But a lot of our work is done independently. What I found that was very helpful in our work was making sure that people understood the work of advocates. So we profiled a lot of people who were doing work in the wrongful conviction field. You know, we profiled Steve Clark in Chick's office. We profiled Dick Cunningham, who had done a lot of appellate work. I found that a lot of readers don't appreciate appellate advocacy. Um, it doesn't get the attention that trial work does, and it should, because it's fascinating. So we went out of our way well, I think it's fascinating, but it just might be me. Um, so we went out of our way to make sure that people understood how a lot of times wrongful convictions were exposed by people working inside the field. Yeah, not to ignore your question, but to go back to your question about why my office didn't do the legwork and put it all together. I think part of what the power 
uh, of investigative journalism is, is if it's done right, if it's comprehensive, and if it's from a publication that's very well respected, it's viewed as uh, having a lot of credibility, accuracy, and it's a source that uh, people are going to pay, pay attention to. And I think the fact that the Tribune did it rather than us made a huge amount of difference in how it was accepted by the public, by public policymakers. Uh, and so I think it, it, it was great that we didn't have the resources and they did back then. And in answer to your question, I think it depends on whether you're trying to sell a story or whether you just need to put spin on a story that's going to be written about anyway. Um, if you're trying to sell a story, you can pick and choose which people in the media you want to go to. Um, and if you have a relationship with them, then, like Scott said, you can talk off the record, see if they're interested in it, how would they write it up. Uh, but when you're just trying to put spin on something you know is going to be written about uh, or talked about, it, it, then the, you have to make the decision, what can I say, what soundbite that I use is going to be on the air or not. Uh, are they going to make it look negative or positive? And it's it's just a gamble. Yeah, and if I could add one thing very quickly. To me, what's unsettling is when I get mail from prison. Because when I get calls from attorneys, I'm accustomed to that. But you know, when you do this kind of work, I'm sure Jennifer's had the same experience, you end up getting a lot of unsolicited mail. And I have whiffed on some of these cases. And I have one letter that I've kept for about 17 years from Ronald Jones, who was an Illinois death row inmate who wrote me in the late 1990s saying that he was innocent. And I didn't do anything with the case. I was working on a number of different series at that point. Well, it turned out everything he wrote in that letter was absolutely true. He was innocent. And there was a judge who was being an obstacle to not let him get the DNA testing that he was seeking. And I've kept that letter just as a reminder you know, that we get a lot of inmate mail, and it is a real mistake to just casually put it in to this pile over here that you'll get to later. Because within that mail, there might be a really important story that needs to be told. But it's so hard to do the sifting. I also have a letter like that, but I don't even like to even think about it. But Marty Tancliffe, which became a famous case in New York State, he wrote to me and a zillion other journalists very similar, and he ended up, you know, was a wrongful conviction case. But the truth is that journalists, and I was talking to um, Julie from the Miami Herald, who I know gets a uh, uh, probably more, more inmate mail than any of us, who's just, you just don't have the time and resources to deal with this. I mean, it's, you know, it's like you need like five journalism students to deal with the amount of mail coming out and the sort of injustices being um, talked about because, you know, the time it takes to check out each of these is, is extraordinary. So I could keep talking about these things with the four of you for, for hours, um, but our time uh, has come to an end. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to our executive director, Larry Schwartzdahl, who uh, is an ex has extraordinary executive director and, and deserves an enormous amount of credit for putting together this, what I have found to be a terrific, stimulating, interesting conference. Um, but before I turn it over to Larry, I want to thank um, the four of you for um, not just for the, what you've offered us today um, uh, and your presentations and your discussion, um, but for the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. This was really wonderful. And uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Um, Thank you to uh, all of the panelists for really uh, a fascinating series of discussions. Thank you for everyone who's come here uh, to be part of this conversation. Um, and, and you know, just, just in, in thinking about the, the discussions over the last day and a half, one of the things that's really stuck with me was a comment that Bill Keller made at the, the first panel uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, he said that traditionally, newspapers have covered crime and they haven't really covered criminal justice. And I, I think that that's a really apt frame for thinking about the moment that we're in, the importance of having these kinds of conversations, even when the media is writing about crime rather than criminal justice, it's having profound effects in shaping our criminal justice system. Um, and so the, the stories that we hear, the images that we see uh, are, inescapably going to be part of creating the system that we have. 
Um, and, and that's why we uh, in the criminal justice program, um, in, in thinking about some of the opportunities for policy uh, change, including sort of profound policy change in the criminal justice system and thinking about some of the limitations, um, wanted to, to bring together this important conversation. A, 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 another comment along those lines that has really resonated with me uh, was something that Julie Brown said earlier today in, in talking about being a journalist, uh, an investigative journalist focusing on uh, life inside prisons in Florida and how the, that work of reporting on the criminal justice system has changed her and how uh, when you start to change enough people in institutions, like journalistic institutions, the institutions start to change. Um, and so thinking about how the, uh, uh, the media's approach to, uh, to, to journalism is changing is, is one important dimension of thinking about how the criminal justice system is changing and is going to continue to change. We're particularly excited to be having this sort of conversation here at Harvard Law School. Uh, uh, lawyers are going to be, uh, are and will continue to be uh, one set of actors working in the criminal justice system, thinking about how to remake the criminal justice system, uh, imagining uh, um, uh, approaches to reform and understanding the, uh, the, the stories that we hear and the images that we see are gonna be profoundly important in shaping that, uh, the space for those forward-looking uh, visions. So we, again, are really excited to be uh, in this conversation with all of you over the last day or so, and thank you again for joining us.